Okay, so this is part two of the chapter 15 lecture video. Um, hopefully this one works. I've had a lot of technical difficulties this afternoon, but before I put up the slides for the, the chapter 15 part two lecture, I wanted to bring you here into D2L. Over here you can see the lecture videos and assignments for chapter 15. Um, here's the first video. And I wanted you to pull up this PDF right here. And you don't have to do this now, but later on, I want you to check this out and look through it. These are the pregnancy categories that the FDA assigns to drugs that they approve. And they go from letter A to D, and then X and N. And so A is basically things like prenatal vitamins and things, and there are definitely information studies out there that shows that they're safe for human fetuses. And then B and C are a little bit more risky. D um, shows that there is evidence of a risk, and so um, there's something that normally wouldn't be used, like tetracycline, which is an antimicrobial um, and those are uh, a lot more risky, but there might be conditions where a mom might have to have it to save her life. And so those risks um, are not outweighed by the benefits. So um, this just kind of ties back into that risk benefit analysis that needs to be done anytime a drug is taken. Um, and then X, the contraindicated um, a drug would be basically something you cannot give during pregnancy, like oral contraceptives, for example, um, things that cannot be given to, in, to humans. And then N are drugs that haven't been effect, uh, effectively studied yet by the FDA, like herbal supplements and, and so forth. Okay, so I'll have you give, take a moment when you get a moment, when you get time to, to look at that. Okay, so now we'll go back over to our PowerPoint and continue on with our chapter 15 lecture. Okay, so this slide here, we can get it pulled up, is going to be a very important slide. Okay, so I'm going to put a big star there by that slide. Um, it has a lot of really good information on it. First of all, it says that ideal drugs target structure, structures and processes that bacteria have or do or go through and humans do not. So structures that humans don't have, cell walls. Okay, so that's a really good target for bacteria so that it will um, be more toxic to the bacteria than to the human, right? Because we don't have a cell wall. So if there's a drug that can target and destroy cell walls, it doesn't harm us. Also processes. Um, bacteria have a lot of different metabolic processes than us. Um, and one is gonna be this folic acid um, metabolic process. And we'll talk more about it later. But those are some good ways that drugs can target um, bacteria or other pathogens um, because they have structures or processes that we do not have. Okay, now in the last video, we talked a little bit about modes of action or how the drug works to either inhibit or um, inhibit growth or kill the bacteria directly. Okay, so I want you to know these five different modes of action, and there's others, but we'll just focus on these. Okay, you have to know these. Okay, so one way that certain classes of drugs attack pathogens or bacteria specifically is by attacking their cell wall production, their cell wall synthesis. Okay, and then there's some examples here like penicillin. There are other drugs that um, attack the cell membrane. Okay, so we have the cell wall and then the cell membrane in here. Okay. Then we have drugs that attack the DNA or RNA, the nucleic acids. We have drugs that attack protein synthesis. We know from the transcription translation chapter that um, protein synthesis is very important. So, so cells can do metabolism, grow, reproduce, all kinds of different things like that. And then we have folic acid or metabolic pathway disruption of some sort, okay? So these first three modes of action typically, not always, but typically kill the bacteria. So they're bacteriocidal. And then the other two are usually bacteriostatic, which prevents reproduction. 
Okay, so again, this is a very important slide. Make sure you know these five different modes of action and that we can target pathogens based on differences in their structure and processes. Okay, now the next couple of slides are really good summary slides that you can go back through and uh, look at. Talks a little bit about whether they're bactericidal, excuse me, or bacteriostatic. Um, it talks about their target, so this one happens to be the cell wall. Um, whether they're narrow, broad spectrum, and, and so forth. These are going to attack protein synthesis and just kind of divides them out and categorizes them. Now we're not going to talk about each one of those different types of drugs. We're just going to pick out a few in the interest of time. Okay, so let's start out with the first mode of action that we looked at, cell wall production. So drugs that are going to target the cell wall of these bacteria. Most, pe most people, huh, no people, most bacteria have a cell wall made up of peptidoglycan, okay? And then a slide or two here, we're going to look at the structure of the cell wall to remind you of what that looks like. Um, but it is, peptidoglycan is basically NAM and NAG subunits linked together by amino acids or, or peptides. And those peptides are kind of like rebar, just reinforcing those cell wall layers together, okay? Without that reinforcement, the cell's just going to fall apart. And so the process of building that reinforcement, that interlinking, or reinforcement is called transpeptidation. That's the name of that process, okay? Drugs that affect the cell wall can stop transpeptidation or prevent that reinforcement of the cell wall, and they can interfere with that in a few different ways, but that results in weakening of the cell wall and then that will lead to cell lysis. Remember lysis means to burst. So the cell basically bursts open and die because its cell wall is not reinforced. So here on this side we have a normal looking, actually right here, a normal looking cell wall. These are the NAM and NAG subunits here, and they form different layers. And in a nice healthy cell, transpeptidation links those um, together and it makes a nice strong cell wall. We have a nice normal morphology of the cell. In the presence of, for example, penicillin or an antimicrobial that uh, basically disrupts the cell wall production or transpeptidation, um, you don't get that cross-linking. These are not joined here, and so that cell is very cell wall is very weak. Okay, and then osmotic forces of water and other substances just basically destroy that cell wall and cause those cells to burst open or lice. Okay, so molecularly, what is doing this is a structure called beta lactam. Okay. Penicillins, cephalosporins, carbenopenems, um, and monobactams are all beta-lactam antimicrobials. They have this structure that's highlighted in green, okay? It's a beta-lactam ring structure. And what that does, this structure here basically binds competitively or inactivates the enzymes um, I'm sorry, it binds competitively with the bacterial enzyme that crosslinks, okay, that transpeptidase um, enzyme that makes that crosslink. These bind with that and they basically stop the cross-link procedure, okay? It basically prevents that cross-linking from being made, 
Okay, that's what these structures do. Now, bacteria, though, have evolved. Um, whoops, go back. Bacteria have evolved. enzymes, these are new enzymes that inactivate these drugs here, okay? Those are called beta-lactamases. And these are bacterial enzymes that destroy the drug. And then the drug has no effect on the bacteria, okay? So that is one way that bacteria have become resistant to beta-lactam antimicrobials or these types of antibiotics is they basically just destroy, they'll come in here and break apart this beta-lactam structure, that lactam ring, and it has no effect then on the bacteria. But some drug drugs um, have components now called beta-lactamase inhibitors that combat these resistance enzymes produced by the bacteria. Okay, so augmentin, for example, um, is an antibiotic in this cell wall inhibition category that contains extra chemicals in it that basically prevent those beta-lactamase enzymes produced by the bacteria from destroying it. So then it can still go ahead and have its effect. Okay, but this doesn't work on all bacteria, unfortunately, but for some it does. Um, I'm not going to talk about this one down here, but I just wanted to mention penicillin G. In the last video we talked about antibiotics and um, Antibiotics are the naturally occurring version, and that would be penicillin G in this family, okay? Then ampicillin and amoxicillin, these are going to be their, the kind of the first and second generation or the semi-synthetic versions. They're a modification of penicillin G, okay? And then we have um, just to mention methicillin and oxicillin, those are two, these are two um, antimicrobials. And also, by the way, you've probably seen a, a, yeah, a pattern here. We have the cillins, penicillin, methicillin, ampicillin. Um, those are all um, in that same family. <clears throat> but methicillin, um, is an antimicrobial, and it is the antimicrobial that MRSA is resistant to. MRSA stands for methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. Okay, and there's also ORSA, which is oxacillin resistant Staph aureus as well, and they're um, fairly common in the population now. I'm going to skip um, cephalosporins and move into um, the carbapenems, <laughs> I can't even say it. Um, these are, again, cell wall targeting drugs that are going to be pretty effective against some bacterial strains that are resisted against multiple drug um, types. Okay, so these types of drugs are reserved for um, patients that haven't responded to the normal antibiotics for a particular infection and also for those that have um, picked up an infection in a healthcare setting um, and that's going to be resistant to other antibiotics as well. Okay, so that's um, this class. Um, but we're starting to see some of the bacteria becoming resistant to the carbenopenems as well. Um, those are called CRE, um, resistant enterobacteriaceae, um, and that would be things like Klebsiella pneumoniae and also E. coli, where they're resistant to the kind of the big dog type micro, uh, antimicrobials. And these CREs, are very, very difficult to treat. OK, 
right? Because they're kind of, they're getting resistant to our like kind of last line of defense. Okay, um, and then the last cell wall drug that I wanted to look at was the isoniazid, niazid, um, and that is used to treat tuberculosis. It's going to interfere with mycolic acid synthesis. Remember, that's that waxy layer that the uh, mycobacterium, mycobacterium tuberculosis have in those acid fast bacteria. I'm going to also point out that um, it's used in combination with. Tuberculosis is very, very resistant. You usually take many different types of antibiotics, antimicrobials to um, counteract tuberculosis, and you usually take those for months at a time once um, you've been diagnosed and begin treatment. Okay, another mode of action would be DNA. Oop, that out of the way. DNA synthesis disruption. And there's a category called quinolones. Um, we're just going to look at the fluoroquinolones. Um, these are synthetic, so they're completely made in a lab, and they contain a fluorine atom. That's where you get that fluoro part. They're going to ta target DNA replication enzymes. So um, if a bacterium is getting ready to replicate, but it can't copy its DNA, it's not going to be able to reproduce. These are typically broad spectrum, or they are broad spectrum antimicrobials, and they're also reserved for those that um, those infections where we're having some resistance to other antimicrobials. Um, example of those would be um, ciprofloaxin or cipro. We're going to actually go through um, a worksheet here and talk more about cipro at the end of this video. Um, and then levofloaxin is good for, it's used to treat mycoplasma pneumoniae. If you remember the mycoplasmas, they have, oops, sorry, no cell wall. And so we couldn't use um, a penicillin or something like that on them because they don't have a cell wall. So uh, targeting their DNA would be a good way to um, attack those types of bacteria. Okay, skipping another one, and then we're going to go to the drug category that targets folic acid production, and we're going to talk a little bit about the sulfa drugs. Okay, sulfa drugs were actually the first drug antimicrobial used in humans to treat infections. Penicillin was discovered first, but sulfas were actually um, put into a form that could be used in humans before penicillin. Um, also kind of to note, um, there are more people with sulfa allergies than there are with penicillin allergies. Um, we just hear a lot more about the penicillin allergies because they're much more severe. Um, they can go cause shock and, and things like that. Um, but sulfa drugs are bacteriostatic, so they prevent reproduction and they typically have a broad spectrum. Okay, now this is one of the processes that humans don't have, okay? So um, folic acid must be consumed by humans, okay? We cannot make folic acid. We have no metabolic pathway to create folic acid. We have to consume it in our diet. That's why they tell pregnant women that they have to eat a bunch of leafy greens or take supplements um, because our bodies cannot make it. However, in bacteria, they can synthesize or make folic acid. So they have a metabolic pathway that takes um, one reactant and creates through a pathway folic acid, okay? And so we start out with the product here and we're going through the pathway and we eventually get to PABA, para-aminobenzoic acid, and that goes into dihydrofolate or something like that. And then eventually we get to folic acid and then from there, that's used then to help make DNA, okay? Now there are enzymes, just like we saw with cellular respiration, that convert this product to that product. And there's an, env an 
enzyme here that converts this to that, okay? Now, if you look at these structures, here's the original substrate, okay, PABA. Sulfonamide looks very, very similar to PABA, except for this region down here. So sulfonamides um, bind with the enzyme and prevent the pathway, oops, pathway from producing folic acid. Okay, so this enzyme here, I think it's dihydrofolate, whatever this product is here, this enzyme essentially shuts down the pathway because it's bound to sulfonamide, it cannot convert PABA to this product here. Okay, and we don't have this pathway, so it's a good target for um, microbes. Okay, sulfa drugs can be given through a, a few different routes and it also can be combined with silver to help burn patients and protect them. Okay, some drugs attack the ribosomes, which is going to affect protein production. Okay, uh, remember ribosomes have a large subunit and a small subunit. Some attack the large, some attack the small. Um, z pack maybe some of you have had that before. It's a macrolide. It's going to attack the large ribosomal subunit. Um, clindamycin, we're going to skip. Tetracycline, that's another one that is going to attack a ribosome, but it's going to be the sol small subunit. And it's broad spectrum, it's bacteriostatic, so it prevents reproduction. Um, and we'll look at some of the diseases that it um, can treat or infections that it can treat, but it has a lot of side effects. Okay, so this is one I mentioned that has a pregnancy category type D. There's a lot of side effects, but there may be situations where a tetracycline is warranted so you can clear up that infection. Okay, so um, with tetracycline, there's an increased risk of uh, secondary infection. With C. diff, um, remember that's the uh, endospore forming bacteria that when the normal biota, microbiota in the gut is disrupted, it can cause severe diarrhea. Um, that's C. diff. Um, photosensitivity, so if a person's out in the sun, they can sunburn a lot more easy, uh, a lot easier, I guess I should say. And then it also has issues, it causes problems with the bones and the teeth, even in adults, if you're exposed to it long term, um, which usually doesn't happen in developed countries, but um, can, it forms complexes, tetracycline forms complexes with calcium and other minerals in the bones and teeth, and it causes them to degenerate, to, mis, to become miscolored and, and so forth. Okay, so there's some examples, tetracycline, um, doxycycline, um, used to treat things like cholera, Lyme disease, syphilis, anthrax, and plague. Um, so there may be situations where it's needed, but um, have to remember there's some pretty significant side effects with tetracyclines. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and skip the aminoglycosides. Um, and jump into um, those that target the cell membrane, like polymyxin B. Um, if you ever have used neosporin or um, triple, whoops, triple antibiotic cream, polymyxin B is one of those of the of the three, the triple parts of it. Um, polymyxin B, neomycin, and bacitracin. Um, are the three that are in there. But polymyxin B has a pretty narrow spectrum of action. It's going to work on gram-negative bacteria, and it interacts with the lipopolysaccharide. Remember LPS, which is contains lipid A, which is also known as endotoxin. And that's, that, um, that's a part of that outer membrane on the outside of the gram-negative cell wall. Okay, so it's gonna 
destroy that outer layer on the gram negatives. Remember, gram positives don't have that outer layer. And then it also can disturb the cell membrane on the inside, which then will cause lysis or rupturing of the cell. Okay, and this just kind of shows um, it'll attach and the damage that um, can happen to the outer. This is that outer membrane, outer cell wall membrane. And then this is this inner cell membrane. And these are again gram negative bacteria because the gram positives don't have this outer layer here. They have a huge thick layer of peptidoglycan. Okay. So that ends our discussion in chapter 15 for this video. There's one more, I know, bear with me, one more video. Um, but I wanted to show you one more thing in D2L um, that's going to be an assignment, okay? So if we get into D2L, we come down here into this uh, PDF file called Cipro tab. We open it. Okay, this is a drug information sheet that comes with a lot of times um, different drugs. Pharmacists will have them, um, doctors will have them. Sometimes it comes in the package when you get a prescription. And I think it is very, very important for you to have this practical experience of looking through some of this information. Now there's gonna be a ton of big words and a lot of words you won't understand what they mean. There's words in here that I don't even understand. I have no clue what they mean. Um, but that being said, um, I'm not gonna make you try to understand those big words that even I don't understand. I want you to just get used to the layout of these information sheets and where you can find some information. Because you may get to a situation where um, a doctor has ordered um, a particular medication for a patient, but didn't really give a lot of information about dosages or how it's administered. Um, and so you might have to look up the information on a sheet like this, okay? So let me, we'll come right back to that. But if we go back here, there's a worksheet that I want you to fill out. It's called the Cipro Worksheet Update. And it is a Word document and you can come down here and either download it and as a Word file and type in your answers to these seven questions or you can print it off and hand write in the answers and then take a picture of it or somehow um, load it when you finish the assignment you will come here and click on assignments, Cipro worksheet, and then you can click on add file here and it will um, allow you to then upload that particular file once you've completed the assignment. This will be due Friday the 27th by 11.59 p.m. Okay, but let's go back, oops, not to the class list, to the content to um, this worksheet. I'm gonna kind of help you walk through the first question, okay? So normally I would give you that big product information sheet as a handout in class. And I would have crossed off already all the impertinent information, the stuff that you do not need, okay? But I don't have access to that. So I've come through here and I've gone in and written page numbers and title headings uh, or heading title, whatever section titles so that you know kind of in the general area where you need to look for this information. Okay, so the first one it says, what are Cipro tablets and Cipro oral suspension? Okay, so let's go back over here. And that's found on page one in the description. So if we come up here, this is for, this product sheet is for Cipro tablets and Cipro, Cipro oral suspension, so the pills and then the liquid form. We go down here to the description, it says, these tablets and oral suspension are synthetic, broad spectrum antimicrobial agents. Okay, so that's basically the answer to number one. They're synthetic broad spectrum antimicrobial agents. 
okay? So they're synthetic. They were designed in the laboratory. They weren't taken from another organism and they're broad spectrum, okay? So um, there's different pages through here. Um, one that you'll look at, let's see, um, on this particular page, page four, indication indications and usage okay you'll just read through here and try to pick out some of the information about this particular product as it relates to what we talked about in lecture okay now i know what you're thinking you're like oh my gosh i have all these videos and online homework and stuff this exercise is something we would have normally done in class okay so i'm not trying to add extra stuff for you uh, and we won't have extra stuff like this um, for most of the other chapters okay so i apologize this is i'm hitting you with this um one here um but um i think it's a really important exercise for you to do okay so stay tuned we'll get the third lecture uploaded and we'll give you some information about um how to proceed so just keep looking for those future things we'll talk to you soon